Hey, everybody. Uh, oh, there? Yeah, come on over. Uh, it's a great San Francisco summer morning, right? Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> As yeah, good as it gets, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, I have my kids in the, in, in the 32nd floor upstairs and, 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 and introduce them to San Francisco, view. and they couldn't see it because the fog was up there. Oh, so that's San Francisco uh, in the they summer. They go to 31st. There is a good view there, so it's a little bit lower. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Vanya, we, we prepped, if you recall, I, I remember, we, you know, it was last month when we, st yeah. we started talking about this yeah. conversation. I was at Remars at a conference. I remember sitting on the couch outside of one of the buffets talking with you and being struck, maybe blown away by the number of presentations from Amazon at that particular event. And I remember asking you right off the bat, wow, you know, just, I, I met a, a healthcare company that ripped up their entire tech stack to implement right. AWS, right, the RoboMaker um, version. And um, I, was, I was asking you, so why on earth would anyone want to build AI today? And you've been at companies Right, right. That have been building, but also weighing when not to build. And you had an interesting answer. Do you remember uh, what it was? Right. I mean, so there's a couple of questions here. Why would you use AI in general, or why would you build the stack build. yourself versus uh, go and use somebody that Amazon could provide? I think the question is about the latter, right? Yeah. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't think there's a real need for you to build anything from scratch these days. Um, like in the 19. 5, 19, 10 kind of time frame uh, when you wanted to build something that was processing data that scale, call it AI or something else, uh, you basically had to build everything from scratch. I mean, like in, in Yahoo, we would build some ad platforms and uh, we, on the team, we have to have somebody who knew optimization. That means exactly how you tune the parameters um, and somebody who does infra and somebody who does search. So to build the whole system, you had to get all these competencies. It was really, really hard. And it was a very unique kind of a thing to do. Uh, but these days, there's really no need to do that from scratch. And I think um, you know, one of the most interesting thing about this technology is that it commoditized inside out. It actually, uh, usually technology is commoditized from the simplest part um, in AI. It seems like the commoditization comes from the most complicated part. So yeah. that's uh, that's really amazing. It still amazes me, actually. And and you know, I still kind of I was listening to your intro, and you know, you kind of gave the reasons of why this technology spread so fast. But it, it's still kind of a mystery for me, you know, how it happened that the most complicated part, which is the optimization course, um, commoditized already. So I would not recommend anybody actually build their own optimization. Yeah. And, and in the companies where I work, when we build strategies for AI, that's one of the premises we kind of say. We say no yeah. in-house optimization. You, you go and you pick it up from your you know, favorite cloud provider. Right. Yeah. And, it, it, and I, thought, I find your, your, your answer at that time, uh, well, you, you just gave half of it. The, the other half was, okay. is it game over? Has, has Amazon won? Right, and maybe because I was coming out of that event. Okay, so and, that, you, and you were basically saying they've been, you know, so it's, it's basically so commoditized that they haven't necessarily won either. Right, so, everyone's doing. Yeah, so, so game over is a, is a dramatic statement, I think. We're just starting yeah. here. But um, so I think your question is what does the future look like for um, AI technologies, right? So is it going to be a world where, you know, the technology is going to be dominated with a few big players, or is it going to be a world that the pendulum is going to swing back, and uh, companies like ours and other companies will will do more in-house? Um, and I think there, there are multiple different worlds that that could happen. Um, the one of the key reasons that brought this democratization of AI, which I think is the main force, more than the increasing ability and more than uh, the complexity of algorithms, the, the availability of it is, is kind of the key change. And one of the key drivers was the open source technology. And so what's happened over the last five years, companies like Amazon have taken an open source technology, put it in-house, and then they start running it for you. Like Amazon or Microsoft will run TensorFlow that was built by Google. Um, Amazon or Microsoft could also run MySQL that was built as an open source. So the key question in my mind as I plan strategies for companies is kind of predict the future. Um, is it going to be that the internal versions of what the cloud providers run is going to be substantially better 
than the ability of us as independent operators to run those systems with internal employees within the these, company. These, but if these open source systems you could take off the shelf as well, right? Right, but to run this in an effective and efficient way over this cloud platform, you'll have to hire the people <clears throat> and you have to have enough competence to do that. So, um, and you know, obviously the cloud providers could tune these things specifically for their cloud to the point where it will be you know, impossible for somebody, even for somebody like us, that we're you know, a pretty sophisticated shop to, to be able to achieve that, that level of sophistication. I mean, the, the, the benefit of you running it yourself is that you're gonna adjust it to your own business and thus make it somewhat better. But so where is the balance? And I think the jury is still out on that. Um, I think the cloud companies have provided um, systems that you know, they market and, and run. And I would say for smaller, and for smaller companies, like if you're a startup or something, you could start using whatever they provide you in-house, but if you believe that you're gonna come to a size that's gonna be substantial one day, you, know, you need to think about the dependencies you're gonna to have to the cloud providers. And at that point, you might need to decide to do things on, on your own. So yeah, so there's a fine line there and you know, uh, we all balance it, right? But uh, yeah. the, the future is uncertain and w where exactly it's gonna go, is it gonna be you know, that there still will be a thriving uh, open source systems that you can adjust with some reasonable amount of effort to your particular use case, uh, or is it going to be that the cloud solution is going to be just the best thing that you can use? Um, I, you know, I need a crystal ball for that one. Yeah, yeah, great. So we, we are going to take questions at the end for you. We, we, we've reserved five minutes, uh, so uh, we want to just go through a few other topics. Um, ads. The I wasn't ad, aware about that, but okay. The questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, just say no comment. Are you, are you okay with that? <laughs> That's okay. Sorry, I should have cleared that That's with okay. you. I thought, uh, it's <laughs> my bad. So, um, uh, ad supported businesses, Vanya. Uh, you, so, you, you've been at ad supported businesses for most of your careers so Yahoo, Google, most recently Pinterest. Uh, you just joined Airbnb, and one of yeah. our, when, when we, we talked, you were saying that you were interested in, in moving away from ad support business and try, trying something new. Yeah. Can you tell us why, right? Because it, um, it started, right? All the stuff, the, the AI started with yeah. ad, ad optimization. Um, I mean, I don't think it was only me, but you know, I came in the Silicon Valley early 2000, just before the crash. Great timing, you know? And uh, um, I think the whole valley and the whole industry was dominated with, with ad supported business. The whole internet was, was supported by that. I mean, that's how internet evolved. So I think a lot of us that were kind of in the, uh, so I started work, do working on databases because database was the only proven software business in the valley before the internet, right? I mean, that was, that was making some revenue, but then a lot of us kind of shift toward internet-based businesses and, and inevitably so to, to ad-supported businesses. And I think that, so I spent most of my career in, on the ad side and I think it was time for me to to kind of uh, go back a little bit to something else and to, to, the, to, to almost enterprise because Airbnb has that flavor of both um, enterprise and consumer. Um, but I think the, the, the interesting point here is uh, how did uh, the internet orientation of the Valley and, and, and the ad businesses in general influence the technology that we developed over the last 20 years? Uh, because a lot of the open source technology and the other technology developed to support those type of businesses. So if you look at the uh, technical char characteristics of an ad business is that it's a very high volume. Um, I mean, the revenue events in, the, in an ad business are probably you know, three to four order of magnitude as many as it would be in a business like Airbnb. Uh, that's a click on an ad or a, even an impression on an ad versus a booking by a client. And so a lot of the technology we developed over the time was to support that high volume, very simple interaction kind of model. Um, so you know, you had first coming with huge storage layers or you know, um, kind of failing hardware that came and then you had uh, frameworks to process this event and do very little processing on the top, and that's how MapReduce came in, you know? Um, and then on the top of that, you had systems like Kafka that would do stream processing, and then even, you know, as 
machine learning and AI uh, came on board, I think even that technology was built for uh, a massive amount, but fairly low information kind of uh, data. And I feel that we as a technical community, I still count myself part of it, although you know, I've been doing other things lately, but um, I think we solved that problem pretty well. So if you have a lot of data and you know, that data has fairly simple kind of features and you can, you can fairly easily pull a system. And you know, I, I often give the example of my 14-year-old daughter that was able to download TensorFlow and, and run um, some inference. But you can fairly easily pull up a system that will do everything for you. It will do the feature kind of selection. It will train, and, and you will be able these days to even serve it. They will even build the pipelines that will process your data uh, based on the frameworks out there. So I think that's, um, that's a relatively solved problem. And, and also, as a, as a target problem, it's like response predictions, what we call response prediction. It's like you show something to the user, and they respond to it or not. At large scale, I feel that's a solved problem. You can, uh, you know, there's thousands and thousands of papers, there's systems, there's everything. You can, you can probably take somebody who doesn't have a lot of AI background and let them solve that problem in your company. I don't think that's a, but other kind of learning that we have, and uh, to go to my current job where you have less data, but you have events that are much richer in context and they're much more connected to the real world. They're connected to uh, what we call listings, which are, which are accommodations. They're connecting to people where the interactions between the users and the systems is longer lasting. You, know, you don't just go and book a trip in three seconds or in a sub-second when you click on an ad, but you go and you, you have a longer term interactions, learning from, um, you know, from a lot smaller amount of data, it's a lot more complex. Now that's not solved. And um, you know, it's not solved for machines, our brains do solve it. Uh, somehow, so we need to figure out how that works, and I think that's an interesting frontier, and you know, it's part of the reason why we, you know I am where I am. Yeah, yeah. We, so, so that complexity, Vanya, and we, I want to get to these other things, right? Because you talked about sure. still being technical, but you're doing a bunch of other things. Yeah. Um, but uh, there, there's increasing conversations that are moved, as you say. It's interesting you're saying the problem's been solved, right? The, the neural nets can only do so much, right, on, on the advertising side. Uh, or the algorithms can only get so good, right? So, so you're moving to co more complex issues outside of that. Is there a term for this developing sort of, uh, of construct where, where, where you're, you're overseeing a lot of these AI projects with a logic on top, right, because of all the complexity? Or is, it's, it's how, how, would you, how would you characterize your, your technical called, strategy? It's called my daily life, I think. But <laughs> I don't know if there's a term, but you know, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's what we do in enterprises like ours. But uh, I think you, you're very correct. A lot of the work, I would say 90% of the work we do in AI in companies like Airbnb is outside of the course. It's, it's actually binding into the business processes and the specificity of, 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 the, of the business that we do. Um, I, and, and, and also that reflects in the people I hire, but we can talk about it a little bit later, yeah. But I, I'm not aware of any specific term of how would you call this. But it's a, it's a good point. Maybe we should invent a term for the discipline that uh, I think is very important. Maybe we'll invent one today. Right? We're going to be hearing a lot. Yeah. If there's, a, there's another company that's coming after you talking about, about By some term of Term sourcing? We can ask the, you know, the audience to give us a term in a that's a, that, Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's, let's kick that off over the next couple of days, come back with that term. It's like, how do you describe? the project of you know, having all these multiple AI projects right across the organization and having a logic on yeah. top. I haven't seen the industry definition of it, but we will talk about it today. Um, so uh, where, where was I going to go? Yeah, we, we were going to um, uh, talk, ab talk about the, the ROI that can be achieved from less data, right? Because the assumption is that you can get better results, uh, presumably, from, from more data. So what does that mean? Is, is, is it just is it yeah. harder slogging on the, on the results I side? I think the, the technical community is, is focusing on this lately. It's like, how do you build multiple learning systems? And, and uh, uh, it, there is some indications that our brains function like that, although the, um, you know, I would 
I would disagree a little bit with you, you know, in your opening remarks. I think the technology we're doing is still far from the way that our brains work. Um, but there is some evidence that we, we learn multiple different tasks separately. And then somehow, when we learn a new task, we are able to kind of draw on these other learning mechanisms that we have. So I think there is, there is some work on that, but as every kind of field initially, it's really, really hard to produce tangible results. And, and you know, to some extent, the, the way that our research is publishing is structured, it's really hard to do those type of things. Um, there's also stuff that we've done for a while, like you know, semi-supervised learning and, and some of the other fields where you draw on external information that, um, that you can somehow learn to boost your e-learning. However, um, anything we've currently done on the technology side or anything I, I'm familiar with has, I would say, uh, um, at best moderate, probably just very modest results. So it's something that's very interesting for the technical community. But it's it's unsolved problem at large, yeah. So let's get into some of those other things that you're working on, because we mm -hmm. started technical. That's the, obviously the foundation for what you're doing and your responsibilities. At right, right, time. right. But you've, you've, you've been talking about the cost-benefit ratio. So even in just in the preceding subject, right, is getting those gains. You need the people, right? You, you, and, and then there's a democratization of some of these products. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you're, how, how, wh where you're spending your time? On this yeah. Um, I mean, I spend most of my career on the research side, so industrial research. And, um, and I think uh, that, was, that was a little bit of a different kind of things from now that I manage a, a larger team um, as part of the home search organization at, at Airbnb. Um, I think in the real world, the question is, how do you invest as little as possible to get the result that you need, and where is that sweet spot? So, uh, you know, sometimes it says yes, we have to hire the smartest people, but you know, the other question is, uh, you need to hire the right people actually to to do the job. And I think in AI and machine learning, there is this this difference between the type of people that you can hire and. And, and, and some people fit best in academia, where some of the open source, you know, open-ended problems, as we discussed, are of, of biggest interest. And, and uh, those type of talent might not be the best match for organizations, as, as, as you know, I've been working on in the last few years. Um, then you have also talent that likes to develop the core optimization technologies that we discussed. And you know, if we declare that we will not do that, then th that's probably not the best match. I think you know. Some of the prior places like Google Research and, and Amazon and, and Microsoft and so on are a real good match for that. But bringing that type of talent in an organization like, like where I was at Pinterest or where I'm Airbnb, it, it, it will be a mismatch and people won't be happy. And you know, that's just won't, you won't get the results you need for the, for the company. So, so, and then you have the applied machine learning uh, kind of talent that, that's you know, really focused on, on business goals and using the technologies. And I think that's the majority of the talent that we um, uh, kind of apply in our day-to-day -day work. And that's, where I, that's what I do to, as well on, on the technical side. That's what I am now. I used to be something else, but that's what I'm now. And um, I think it, it's really important as a company to understand the, the mixture of talent that you need in, in every technology, including AI, and then make sure you hire the right type of talent with the right motivation coming from the door, because otherwise you will get, as I said, the both on both sides you will get something that's uh, suboptimal. You'll have people that are not happy, and you know you won't get the goals that you need. So uh, the other dimension is you need to find out um, the seniority level of talent, and you know I think um, I've seen kind of people err on both sides and, you know, where advice, I, I see people that hire too many junior people and then there is no leadership and there is, you know, the other thing, you hire too many senior people and you don't have enough scope for, it, for them as well. So um, I think this is the kind of dimension that's really important to figure out up front before you go out to the marketplace and, and, uh, and then you correct that based what you see in your typical, you know, in a geographic area and so on, and then you make the strategy, and then on the top you layer everything else, like geographies and organizations and whatnot, and that makes your st hiring strategy, and then you design recruiting organizations around it, and you know, so that, that, that's, 
that's what we do, and I think this is part of the, the work. Um, but yeah, building healthy organizations, um, building organizations that have the right mix of talent is, is probably my number one task now. Great. And uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, so, so I see we got about five minutes left, but I wanted to get one question in that is, okay. is big for, for, for this event, which is, which is bias, right? You had a great, uh -huh. great answer last year because this AI and ML is predicated on having bias, at least, in, in, at least on the ad side, right? Where, where, where you're likening someone to someone else to give them something that they have a taste for. Uh, but you talked about that there is some work to clean some of this up, right? You talked about some work at Google cleansing original data. I don't yeah. know if you remember that. But how, how is that field coming along? Well, I mean, I think the, the, the bias in, in the machine learning technology is not specific to the ad world. I think it's present there. Uh, bias, uh, I would say to some extent, uh, bias in AI and machine learning is present because bias is present in the society. Um, and, and then the way we do machine learning in general and the way we do learning as people is that um, we look at the world and we capture the current state of the world. And the problem is the current state of the world is a result of a socio-historical development that might not have been the most just or it does not match to where we aspire to be as a society. And thus, we, as, and computers, when we learn, we reflect that. So um, I think it's an, imp and, and you know, these technologies are especially susceptible to this because they, they learn, right? And um, so how do we tackle that? And you know, we talked last year, um, you know, I, I kind of, um, I kind of mentioned that as well, that at, at, at some point when, when this started occurring, uh, somewhat surprisingly to the community, I would say like 10, 12 years back when I started building these large systems and we could see that some of these things, we honestly, we could not, you know, we, as practitioners, we were, we were a little bit taken back by it, you know, because focused on everyday work kind of. And, you know, some, when, when, when this came out, I was, I was really worried about that because I could not see an immediate way to solve it. And um, I'm, I'm at a different point now. I think uh, by focus and uh, by, by trying to do the right thing, the technical community specifically has, has made some great advances in this area. Um, they have not come to the point that a lot of the solutions have not come to the point where they'll be easy and obvious to use. Um, but there are some great solutions that for us to avoid the key problem, because I think the key problem is excluding populations and mass um, over some dimensions that we know should not make difference. And, and some recent work from uh, Microsoft, uh, from Google, and from academia um, has made great progress where you, if, if you know the dimension, I think if I can characterize the state of affairs in, in the technology is that if you know those dimensions and if you pay attention to what you're doing, um, you will be able to eliminate that bias from your models. But it will require at this point, I think still significant technical sophistication in that. Uh, where we need to get this is we need to get it where it's really easy and it's almost automatic, that it does it for you, alerts it about that, and uh, so you, you, know, you declare your intent not to have it, and it's already there, but we, the technology is not at that point. Uh, so I would appeal to everybody, because the technology is not at the point, to take care of this and to put effort into making sure that your organizations apply these techniques that are out there and hire the people that know how to do that uh, to be able to avoid some of these things, which I think is for the better of the world. Great. Um, so much more to talk about. I did I, I, I ask for questions. We do have time for a question. Uh, so okay. I took you unaware. Right. You did say that That's okay. uh, he had just joined Airbnb. And, um, I've been there for a whole two months. Two, yeah. two months. So thankful for joining us. And obviously, is still getting up to speed on a lot of these things. So I can understand. Um, 
Do we have a question in the audience? We, we have runners with a microphone. Anyone with a question for Vanya? Yep, right here. Thank you. Hi. Whoa. <laughs> Um, you had mentioned that your job is looking for talent. Mm -hmm. um, I think every technical executive, including myself, that's our, we're all competing for talent. We're all poaching each other's talent. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think about the strategy? I've heard a few companies say they're really nurturing talent within yeah. their company and teaching non-technical stakeholders AI and future tech of some sort. Yeah. Um, I mean, the talent strategy is really a multifaceted. We're going over the time, but yes, this is I know. a topic that I'm, I'm interested in. So, uh, talent strategy is really multi multifaceted strategy. It includes uh, bringing talent in. It also includes growing and mentoring talent within the organization, uh, and so it also includes going to non-traditional places and finding talent. And I think. Um, all of these different aspects need to be baked into one cohesive way of how you look at talent. And uh, in general, I would say uh, one comment on the top of what your core question is. I think uh, to be successful in this, you need to run the talent with all dimensions, including diversity, exactly the same way as you run your business. You need to make, you need to find the core metrics and then you need to track that core metrics, and then you need to hold people accountable on, on delivering on that core metrics, and you need to have guardrails, and you need to have everything. You need to have reviews, whatever way you run your business, whatever way you review the key metrics that you care about, that's how you need to work on talent these days. Um, on your core part of the question on non-traditional kind of uh, backgrounds, um, you know, so if we start from what I said before, that AI in general, but technology is, uh, democratizing and they're getting easier and easier to use, um, you know, I think you don't have to go after the, the, a few graduates from the best universities in the US to find the people that can do the job for you. That's, you know, that's, that's just not the reality out there. And the other thing is that in a lot of cases, you have a lot of people that are very, very, very smart that end up not in those top places because variety of reason, including you know the background and they you know uh, where they came from, because you know there is bias in the society. So uh, going after that pool of talent is is very prudent, and even for top places like us, uh, has been a great multiplier. In my prior experience, um, I have built programs that or have participated in building programs that where we have sourced from community colleges. And I can tell you that in some cases, I would hire people from that kind of a non-traditional background, along people from the top schools in the US. And over time, they would perform at a similar level. So I would encourage to, you, know, you to go and look for place, other places than the top places. And you will get people that will perform at the same level from those that come from you know, the very best places in the country. Round of applause. Yeah, great, Vanya. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Yep.